Well, thank you. Uh, actually, we are both from Yuzu uh, Chicago, uh, so he's doing work with, uh, with Lubos, my, um, uh, my co author. And this is a, a, a second paper in a, in a research agenda of trying to study the impact of governments uh, on, on asset prices and more on the theoretical basis. Uh, because we, we figure, you know, a few years ago when we started thinking about this, that, you know, most of the, in finance at least, uh, throughout the macroeconomics, it, you have uh, all these models where firms are operating, people are maximizing, etc. And very often, you know, there is a, a player that is actually not in the model. Uh, you know, you have, uh, uh, this player is called the government. Governments, uh, you know, typically are model, you know, they have fiscal policies, redistributing things, uh, or or you know, monetary policies, but they do much more than that, you think about, because uh, governments uh, define the economic environment in which uh, firms operate. Uh, they define the laws of competition, they define the enforcement of contracts, they define the amount of sometimes corruption that you know, the GCF found. So they, they generate you know, regulation and all things that they are not exactly only redistributive, it's not really only fiscal policy. Uh, etc. And from time to time, as we know, recently they do change these uh, these uh, uh, rules. So we already have one paper gone. This is a sample paper in which uh, um, you know we just realized that the political news move markets. And you know, given that this conference is coming just two days after the Italian election, and uh, on and upon the news we had the down, you know, the stock price dropped two percent in the United States. Well, in Italy five, but two over here, you know, that should motivate that, but those were, you know, Eurozone tech crisis, you know, more chatting about uh, uh, what is going to happen, somebody just announcing that there's going to be a referendum, prices drop across the globe, then they say, well, this guy is kicked out, I'm not saying who it is, and then <laughs> suddenly prices go up. These are all political news uh, and uh, that, that move uh, asset markets, or, you know, it's been mentioned the U.S. debt ceiling, uh, you know, elections, results, etc. And yet, you know, there is really, if you just look at mainstream finance, there is not much raw political news in finance theory, actually. And so we thought, well, you know, maybe we should uh, sit down and try to think about uh, a stylized model just to even think about uh, how do political news uh, enter. Of course, you know, whenever you have political news, as any news may affect the future economic growth, expectation, etc. But more structure, how does it affect the risk premium, how does it affect the expected future cash flows, and all the other stuff. That's what we do in, uh, in this paper. In this paper, we are focusing really on the risk premium before any actual uh, change in political uh, uh, regulation actually takes place. It's just in through, the, uh, through the expectations. So what we do, we develop a model. So there's going to be many theory. We have a little bit of empirical work at the end <laughs> based on, on the index of, of NIP and COPEC, um, in which uh, you know, political news that move uh, asset prices and because you know, it's important to think about uh, in a general equilibrium set, you know, you can just uh, think of um, uh, partial equilibrium because that is the whole point. And, but we want to have the, the minimum departure from, from you know, the classical setting, if you want. So what we are going to do is to take the, what we used to call the social planner, uh, we call it a government. And, uh, and we're giving you know, preferences because that's uh, what we think. So the government uh, in our model is going to have both economic motives and non-economic motives. Economic motives is maximization of social welfare, the usual stuff that we have been doing for ages. But now we actually tweak those uh, this utility function. We said that's his utility function and they maybe maximize something else as well. And uh, if governments will do, they do, they choose policies. That's their work. They don't do anything else. Um, and uh, as soon as you start thinking about it, then you figure that there are really two kinds of uncertainty about politi political uncertainty that show up. One is uh, what we call political uncertainty, and this has to do with what the government will go, is going to do in the future. You know, there is uh, you know, a possibility of uh, reforming the banking sector, but there are many proposals. Which one are we going to choose? Uh, what is the capital ratio? What is uh, you know, what we've got to do with derivatives and all the other things that uh, generate a whole set of possible policy choices. The second uh, is what we call the impact uncertainty, which stands short for policy impact uncertainty. In other words, you know, if you take a dot frank act, you read it very carefully, all line by line, you know exactly what it's doing, etc. What is going to be the long-term impact of this policy reform? 
I don't know, you know, it's an uncertain effect. You know, we are changing the policy, it's going to have an impact, but we don't really know whether it's going to be a good impact or a bad impact. We don't know, so we call it impact uncertainty. And uh, overall, the two things are interacting and uh, generating a lot of effects that are kind of, we find interesting. Um, you know, just the main results out of the, of the theory, a little bit empirical as well, is that the political uncertainty commands itself a risk premium um, on a, its own factor, as we were saying before, a factor. And, uh, but, you know, it's state dependent. This premium is going to be larger in, in poorer economic conditions. So you would find it only when the economy is not doing well, but when everything is doing fine, actually, political risk premium is not there. Um, Political uncertainty reduces the value of uh, what we call it uh, implicit put protection. Actually, put protection is another, you know, what we tend to think about uh, uh, Greenspan before, uh, Bernanke later, uh, comes implicitly, endogenously in the model, and, um, and, uh, and uh, comes markets, but, uh, you know, the additional political uncertainty endogenously is going to uh, eliminate that benefit. And then, of course, uncertainty, as anything that is uncertain, is going to increase volatility, uh, uh, cross correlation across assets, and so decreases the, the diversification opportunities of investors, and so the risk premium goes up, it goes back to its general equilibrium to the, to the top, so to speak. Okay? The model is, uh, I'm going to uh, drive you a little bit through the model to see uh, what uh, the highlights are, but there are going to be a few pictures just to explain it better. Uh, it's in continuous time, it's a financial horizon economy, and uh, there is a lot of uh, equity finance firms. And uh, each uh, uh, firm I is going to have uh, a simple technology, in fact, linear, and uh, this, the growth rate of uh, capital is uh, drift plus a common shock and a uh, idiosyncratic shock. It's as simple as a model as we can think of. Um, mu is a constant uh, and, and known. You know, we have a generalization where it's time variant for a business cycle, nothing changes, so we uh, keep it constant here. And then, you know, the point is, how do we model policies into, into um, government policies into, into something we can manage? Well, at the end of the day, if you do ask the pricing, especially you want to think, uh, you know, there are a lot of, you know, what is a policy? It's a piece of paper with a lot of words on it, uh, which regulates something. But at the end of the day, it's going to have an impact uh, on uh, the economy. And so what we call G here is uh, our, the impact of government policy, the current one, at MT, on average profitability. So that is what, at the end of the day, is going to distill into having an impact on asset prices and general equilibrium. Uh, how does it do that? That's the point of the paper. Okay. This is linear technology. If you want to have a data table technology, top diagram, think about affecting alpha in, uh, you know, between capital and labor. You know, is uh, uh, plenty of examples for that. And uh, so what does the government do? There is a sometime tau in the middle, is uh, right here, is going to decide whether to keep the old policy that has been in place so far or change into new policy. And if it changes into new policy, it's going to have n of n, <laughs> n possible policies. And if it changes the policy, this impact will be different. This g is going to change. Schematically, before tau, that's the old uh, impact of policy zero, the one that is in place, the status quo. And if there is a change, it's going to move to something else. Okay? The decision to change the policy is endogenous. The government will decide whether to change it or not, depending on what we know. Now, um, G itself is not a, just a, a choice variable, otherwise the answer is pick the one with the highest G. Now the point is that every policy is going to map to a G, and uh, all the Gs are actually unknown. I don't know, that's the impact answer. I don't know what uh, this new capital regulation, dot frank action, is going to do. I have a private distribution. So we assume that a set of rules are going to map into a G that uh, is normal with some mean and some variance. And different policies may have different means and different variances. Mean means uh, you know, <coughs> higher potential growth uh, and variance of the uncertainty that you have around uh, the long-term growth of, uh, of this policy. In a sense that, you know, if you have a very simple policy, let's change the capital ratio from 7% to 7.1, well, there's not going to have much of an uncertainty about you know, the, the impact. <laughs> it's about the same as before. But if you completely change the, the uh, the landscape, the policy landscape, most likely to have a lot of uncertainty because uh, we haven't uh, yet experimented the, uh, the new policy. So, in our model, we have the government effectively experimenting with new policies, actually only one time, at time tau, and uh, it's going to learn about it, uh, you know, these Gs. By doing what? By observing 
uh, outcomes. It's exactly what is happening normally. Uh, if everything is going well, it's the, the good policy. The economic environment is good. If uh, things are going down the drain, it's that the economic environment is not too good. Maybe we need to change it. And so he has a posterior belief that uh, is, you know, everything is Gaussian here is a Kalman filter, so we have uh, um, a, a process for, for G-head that uh, is coming from learning. So what does the government observe? They observe all the capital of the new, of the new firms, how they are producing, if they are producing very well, means the economic environment is good, means the G-head will go up. <laughs> okay, so G uh, is going to increase. If instead uh, the capital is going down the drain, like uh, lately, that means that maybe uh, the, uh, the economy is not go good, it means G-head is going down. So G-head is the expected economic growth of the old policy. Okay? So that's uh, and at the time of uh, a new decision, if there is a policy change, then G-head is going to move from this posterior into a prime. And then we start learning again. So the model is very stylized, very simple. You learn about G0 before tau, and you learn about Gn after tau. In this paper, we are going to only look at risk premium way before tau, and not at tau. Tau was the other paper. The new paper is to see what happens down here. Okay? So that's only the impact uncertainty. Let me now finally get to the political side, which is the highlight of this new paper. Um, political uncertainty works as follows. You know, we have investors that maximize something very simple, the utility from final wealth. Standard uh, thing that uh, some people in finance do. And uh, there is the uh, total amount of capital at the end. So homogeneous capital there. With some risk aversion. Our government uh, has uh, uh, preferences as well. And it's very similar. Uh, in the sense that if CN here was uh, equal to 1, then it's exactly social welfare. However, you know, for every policy, it's going to have a cost or benefit uh, to adopt that particular policy. Okay? That's uh, where it's their own preferences. It doesn't have anything. It's not a real cost. It's not that you're burning capital. Anything. It's just their preferences. Why? Well, we have a lot of reasons why they may deviate from social welfare. We could, uh, you know, coming from Italy, Morocco, I can even think of many reasons. But uh, in the United States, there are lobbying groups. There are all sorts of possible things that, that may generate a wage between the social welfare and what the government is going to do. And uh, our point here is that uh, investors, anybody uh, in the economy, actually don't observe the preferences of the government. Otherwise, they would be able to exactly uh, anticipate, but they're going to learn about them uh, over time. <coughs> okay, so we have uncertainty about CN, it generates political uncertainty, because we can't anticipate exactly what the government is going to do. In the future, we can only have prediction of what they're going to do, depending on what we learn. And so they are going to, our agents are going to learn about political costs as well. We have a signal, a steady flow of political news, uh, which is this a continuous time version, if you want, of signal equal true value plus noise. That's how you would model a continuous time. And continuous time is useful for a number of formulas. I'm going to get in a second. And so, like, uh, like before, you're learning about the cost, uh, which means that you have a posterior uh, belief about, uh, which is always normal about uh, its, uh, its dynamics. And the key here is that they were going to call uh, this DZ hat uh, the, with the N and the C as uh, political shocks. These are only news that affect the cost of uh, uh, changing the policy or choosing policy N. So it's uh, one way of uh, inducing political shocks into an otherwise normal model because those are, are going to affect effectively the choice of one uh, policy versus another. Interestingly, you know, by our choice of modeling, where we choose the anyway that is orthogonal to the economic shocks, which is the other one, the other one that with the, the normal G head about the uh, capital accumulation of the economic, uh, economic shocks. And so, we have before T, we have two, before tau we have two learning. We learn about the economy, everybody has uh, symmetric information, everybody knows the same, and uh, we are learning about the various costs uh, uh, of changing the policy. So, uh, what are the results? Well, going down to the, um, you know, if you, if you take social welfare, of course, this maximization of utility is going to just say that uh, uh, policies with higher mean or lower variance are preferred by our investors, which is kind of, uh, you know, that they are uh, discovered, so it's not surprising. So, you know, any new policy is going to increase prior uh, mean or lower variance, or lower the variance, they are welcome. Okay, so that's the idea of a uh, uh, politician coming in and calming the market. So let's choose a policy with very low values so that there's less uncertainty. Um, that's one. 
However, the government is not maximizing this. The government is maximizing that plus this cost. And so they are going to choose, oops, sorry, the, the one with the maximum uh, mu, which is the one you just saw, minus this cost. And that's the cost uh, for the government. And so if a policy is actually very good, but it is also very costly for the government to undertake, they are not going to do it. Or it's less likely they are going to do it. In fact, uh, you know, we have a corollary here It says uh, the government will change the policy if uh, the posterior mean about economic growth, G hat, of the current policy, is less than a threshold. This is a complicated expression, but it's a number, like minus 2%. Okay, so this means that, that the government, uh, uh, if the current, current policy is perceived as uh, <laughs> uh, sufficiently unproductive, then the government will choose a new policy. Okay, so even if it's very costly, if it's really bad, sooner or later they're going to change uh, the policy. In that sense, endogenously, uh, they provide sort of food protection to the market because uh, this decision is going to actually calm the market uh, on its own. Okay, we're going to see uh, what happens. And by the way, this is going to generate an implication that typically you have uh, new policies after crisis, which is one of the things that in political economy people more or less have established. Typically, big changes uh, occur when things are going down. Okay. So far is the real economy, now we have to go to the financial economy, so market prices, uh, there are a bunch of formulas here that uh, I'm going to spare you. Uh, but the key result, if you want, is uh, the fact that uh, we have three types of shocks, all of them price. We have capital shocks, the boring one that is very standard, nothing particularly exciting there. We have this impact shock, uh, the, these are uh, learning about the current policy and what is the long term impact of those ones. Uh, oh, I should have said, this is the stochastic discount factor. So, you know, what you use to discount future cash. And then uh, what is important uh, is this other term here, which is uh, the new one. And uh, it's uh, uh, the po political <coughs> shocks that enter straight into the, the stochastic discount factor. And uh, this is a new factor that comes in, if you want, and it's uh, due to learning about political costs. Because you're learning what these guys are doing, then it's going to uh, have an, infa, an impact on the, uh, the stochastic scale. But what is the intuition there is because what does the government do? Well, when they change a the policy, they don't affect the only few firms. Normally, they have cross-sectional impact on the economy. That's at least our assumption. Therefore, any decision of the government uh, is a systematic factor by, the, by construction. So it's a... Uh, you know, if I am behind and I make a mistake, eh, well, if I have a small firm, nobody cares. You know, that's not diversified away. If I make a mistake negative, it makes it positive, nothing changes. If the government makes a mistake or the government does something big, it's going to affect the cross-sectional firms, which implies that any risk that is in, in implicit in this, uh, uh, in this choice is going to have a, a, pri a price risk, by, by, by definition, if you want. Moreover, we find that uh, it's, uh, it's going to be state-dependent. So this, uh, this uh, odd term here disappears uh, when uh, G hat goes to infinity. In other words, when uh, in good times, actually, you only have the economic shocks. That would be the standard uh, result. But uh, in bad times, uh, then you have one additional uh, risk factor that show up, and that's uh, going to be priced in our model. Um, what else in here? Well, let me just show you a little example with two policies uh, and a couple of pictures. Um, to give the main intuition. And that's a, they, you know, suppose that uh, you know, you're having a, an old policy, and then in case things should go bad, you can cho choose two new policies. Well, let me just tell you what, what they are. One has a high uncertainty, and the other one has low uncertainty. Very simple. So you can get into safer or more risky. And to make it uh, easy from a welfare perspective, assume that they give the same utility. Which we can do it, because we change the mean in a way that, uh, you know, go on the efficient frontier, so to speak. Um, these are some parameters just to put the picture. And this is the key, uh, uh, this plot here is going to be the, the main intuition of what's happening. Um, suppose the type the, on the x axis there is g hat, the, uh, how good is the current policy? Okay, so the one that is uh, uh, in here. And I'm plotting here the probability of adopting a given going policy. The dotted line is the probability of keeping the status quo. If things go well, well, the government is not going to do much. Why? Because, uh, as I said, we are above the threshold, you know, there is no need to change the policy, everybody expects it, <coughs> and so nothing is going to happen. So, but is, uh, if uh, the economy starts going badly, then it becomes more and more likely the government will actually do something. The usual issue at the beginning of the crisis, back in 2008, 
everybody expected the government to do something. Whatever it is, just do something. <coughs> The problem is that as soon as you do that, because you have a menu of possible alternatives, then you have the, uh, you give, a, for instance, 50-50 chance to have a, a, high po a high risk or a low risk type of policy. Okay? And uh, you see, on this side you have zero uncertainty, political uncertainty. As things go badly, then the political uncertainty increases because you give zero probability to keep the all. But like, you don't know what it's going to do. You know, you have two alternatives. And uh, well, you know, one or the other. And this is going to increase the uncertainty about uh, 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 what they are going to do, so the political risk, uh, so to speak. Because exactly, you know, this endogenous, so as G goes back, uh, you have a higher uncertainty there because now you, have, you don't know exactly what they are going to do. And this is going to have an impact on prices. So what I'm plotting here, the x axis is always the same. What I'm plotting here is the market to book ratio for different values. Uh, look only at the solid line. Normally, as you learn about the G hat, then uh, uh, this is the type of price movement that you get, and that's the standard economic risk premium. And notice that as G hat goes down, notice that this plot becomes flatter here. This is the implicit proof protection from the government. As things go bad, you know they're going to change the policy, so current shocks are not going to have much of an effect on long-term cash flows. However, in the same area, you also see that now you have more lines. And these are uh, the new risky policy is more likely, the, the, the one at the bottom, but the new safe policy is more likely. So because you don't know which of the two are going to be chosen, now you have a second factor that shows up with a second risk premium in the, in the model. That's pretty much the story. This generates the main plot. That is, again, theory for calibrating. During good time, you have only impact shock and uh, political shock generating a risk premium. But during bad time, the political risk premium becomes. <coughs> Okay, exactly because the second factor comes into place uh, in, in these times. Um, then we, know we do a lot of different choices here, parameters, just to show that, that things are you know, what happens in different configurations. Let me just uh, skip everything. And um, we also show that uh, the more heterogeneity there is uh, in the policy choices in this menu, the bigger is going to be the impact. Okay, because uh, you know, they're going to change the world or they're going to do something tiny. Well, the, the distance between the two is going to have a big impact on the risk premium, just uh, for the same reason. So let me just keep uh, uh, ahead and go to the quick to the end. So the, um, you know, this is the index that I don't have to introduce because it's <laughs> we have been discussing for a while. And then, um, you know, we do an empirical work and try to, um, you know, you've seen some, some of these also in, uh, in, uh, in Nick's presentation. Uh, the prediction of the model are that during a higher uncertainty period, you should see a higher correlation across stocks and a higher volatility across stocks. Nick already showed that the correlation between volatility, implied volatility, and, uh, and the uncertainty index, the uncertainty index is the, is the uh, red line, is pretty high, it's right here, it's the same picture you saw, saw before. It is actually a correlation across stocks. It's one implication of the model. And as you learn about uh, what the government will do in the future, this becomes a second price factor, and therefore it's going to move all stocks together uh, much more than before. And the dotted line here is actual data, as you can tell, and the uh, solid line is the political uncertainty. You see they're moving uh, on top of each other, especially after, uh, after 2000. Then we do a bunch of regression, but again, that are out of time, let me go to the conclusions. Um, we develop a theory of political news move stock prices, and uh, the three highlights is that uh, the political uncertainty commands the risk premium. It is larger when the economy is not doing well, again, because that's when it's most likely the government will do something or will change something. And then it uh, reduces the value of the government in physical protection because, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. The government will do something in bad times, but because you don't know what they're going to do, it actually increases the risk premium anyway. And so it's all endogenous and increases the volatility and correlation, especially in an economy is weak. 